in the first time that you would understand more of God's will for each one of us. Let's pray anyway. And as we come to Scripture and its meaning for us, I pray that you would illumine our hearts and minds so that we will take something from here to uh, encourage us in our witness to you. Cause us to grow up, Lord God, and cause us to go on to bigger things in your name. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. I've got my Bible open at Revelation chapter 3, and I thought as we were singing that song, I meant to have a Hebrews reading, didn't I? Well, I think not. I think we'll stick with this one. And it's uh, that message of the angel to the church in Laodicea, which is now modern-day Turkey, if uh, that means anything to you. And the angel of the church says, Write the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, says this, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have needed nothing, and uh, you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may become rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed and I sell to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone does hear my voice and opens the door, I'll come to him and will dine with him and he with me. He who overcomes, I'll grant to him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, we're here for another Sunday morning. Is it just something that we do, a routine that we get into, and go home and say, I've been to church now, the rest of the week is before me. No, we're here for a purpose. We're here to worship, we're here to be edified, and we're here to learn. So, uh, Let's get our learning caps on and let's see what we can learn this morning. And I'll just remind you about last week. By the way, I still have some of these cards. If you didn't bring yours or you lost yours already or weren't here last week, here they are. I can let you have them with prayer points on the back. But uh, we reminded ourselves as the wise men from the East brought gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh, we must also bring our gifts to God, the best we've got. I think Neil has already alluded to that in his communion book, the best we've got, a lamb without blemish. Bring him the best. And we reminded ourselves that our works as disciples of Christ will be judged, the beamer seat, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, on the last day. And uh, we will uh, find ourselves in dire straits, some of us, if we're not careful. Wood, hay or stubble, that's not going to survive the fire that will be the judgment tool in God's hand. What about gold and silver and precious stones? Well, we need to serve God wholeheartedly, we said last week. And uh, that's quite a, a job. It's, uh, if it's a New Year's resolution, we've got 360 something days left to do it. So uh, let's serve the Lord wholeheartedly in this year 2020. And finally, as we noted in that reading just now, uh, we need to buy gold. We are advised to buy gold from God Himself. In other words, don't be absorbed by worldly investments or worldly ambitions 
rather be absorbed by investing our lives, our beings, our time in God himself and we will be no doubt rewarded. Well, I said right at the beginning that we're on a spectrum, a wide spectrum, pain, pleasure, and most of us, most of the time, thank God, we're somewhere in between. Not too much pain, but not too much pleasure either. I think there's a verse of scripture to go with that too. It's in Proverbs 30, verse 8. We'll come to that a little later on, perhaps. Uh, we uh, need to pray perhaps that we ought not that we may not be so poor that we're tempted to uh, make or steal or so rich that we forget the Lord. So it's good to be in the middle on that spectrum. Not too much pain, not too much pleasure, because uh, neither of them <laughs> are too much benefit to us. Although as we look at the New Testament we see that the pain does have quite a bit of benefit for us. Uh, we might uh, have a look at a couple of verses as we go along. But the point I'm making is that whatever these circumstances we're in, wherever we are on the spectrum, all of them, all of these circumstances, all of these positions are a call in themselves to prayer. We must be prayerful. Circumstances pear-shaped, then pray. You've got all you need in life, pray and be thankful. We need to be praying as Christians. It is the air we breathe in our spiritual lives. And sometimes I may add, I think our prayer life prepares us for the unknown, painful circumstances that may be yet ahead. By the way, that word pain, extreme pain, takes us back to the cross of Christ. We use the word excruciating pain. Cruci that word cruci cruciate is a pain such as you experience when you are crucified. The worst kind of pain that you can probably ever experience and that can go on for hours and hours and uh, they tell me those who studied the uh, art of crucifixion the Romans knew their work uh, so uh, whatever the circumstances we need to turn it back to God in prayer and a prayer life now will stand us in good stead when we meet the circumstances such as we're going to see on the video when you're ready Kim let's well, by the way, Jamie and Di, we sang this as you came out of the water of your baptism. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. Here is the mighty Lord revival swept across ways. God made himself known in a very special and personal way. After the revival, a Welshman ventured halfway across the world to India, and he tracked up the mountains towards a remote village in the east. He was told to go back and the tribe in the village are famously violent. But the Welshman ignored the warnings because even these savage headhunters should have the opportunity to hear about the mercy of God. One tribesman and his family heard the gospel and received Jesus as their saviour. The good news was too good to keep to themselves and they shared the gospel with others in the tribe. The chief was very angry, and he had the tribesman and his family dragged before the village. Stop following Jesus, the chief demanded. The tribesman replied, No, I have decided to follow Jesus. I am not turning back. The chief was furious and killed the tribesman's children. Stop following Jesus, the chief insisted. The tribesman replied, The man go with me, I still go for him. No turning back. The chief showed no mercy, and he killed the tribesman's wife. Now he will stop following this Jesus, the chief said. The 
tried to marry up the chief in the eyes and replied, The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. The chief could not believe his ears and he killed the tribesman. Jesus said, if a grain of wheat dies, it bears much fruit. And that day, many of the villagers who witnessed the persecution of that tribesman and his family also decided to follow Jesus. Even the chief himself became a follower of Jesus Christ. The tribesman's last words became the song of the village, and today it is sung all around the world. I have decided to follow Jesus. Cyprus and uh, they were staying in hotels for a time. 
expensive undertaking for a missionary organization. So they had to find an alternative, and a brethren man by the name of Lebon Yagayan had uh, a disused campsite up in the mountains, and uh, that was a place where he said we missionaries to go as we escaped Lebanon. Uh, we, Joan and I, had heard that Doug and the Beirut team had left. So uh, we had to make a decision. Were we going to stay in this mountain village and uh, ultimately become dependent, totally dependent on the local people? I remember we had to cook our meals by uh, gas. Gas barrels would come regularly. But with the war, they couldn't get gas barrels through. I mean, that last, that second last gas barrel lasted a long, long time by the grace of God. And it ran out one morning. And that morning, a truck arrived with barrels of gas, and we were able to live another day. But we eventually decided that we should go, and we arrived at Limassol and met up with our headquarters personnel who were there and waiting for us. And I'll pick up the story from there. So the Wicks and the Wilson families arrived in Limassol by Cairo. They were weary but rejoicing. The guard had met their needs when they had reached their extremity, and he had sent his servants to minister to them. It was decided then, in April 1976, barely a month later, that John Wicks and I should return to Beirut to gather the other members of the fellowship together for consultation, and if possible, to arrange for them all to come to Cyprus for a conference. Uh, it was no easy thing for John and Jane to come to the decision. For John to accompany me on the return trip, but they did so before the Lord in submission to him. We purchased our tickets and left for the airport. Half an hour before departure, we experienced this many times in our, in our Middle East missionary career. Half an hour before departure, the flight was cancelled. And uh, so we had to go home. The airport was in Larnaca. We were living in Limassol, an hour's taxi drive away. So we went home and came back the next day. Our next attempt, we boarded the plane only to face a further delay. Again, the flight was cancelled because there was news of heavy fighting in Beirut. And we were held over until the third day and finally got away to Beirut, Doug and I. And uh, then we uh, had to uh, go down into the basement of our mission headquarters, pack up as many books. We had a publishing department, and we produced books in Arabic, Christian books for uh, distribution all around the Middle East. And it was proposed that uh, I look after a depot in Limassol now to distribute, fulfill the orders we had for, for books. Couldn't get them out of Lebanon, but uh, one of the jobs that was mine when we got there was to pack up as many as we could. And also to round up all the other missionaries from uh, as far away as 40 or 60 kilometers out of uh, Beirut. Well, that was Doug's job, he did that. And that was another adventure in itself. But there was another problem. The banks were closed and therefore we couldn't withdraw any money. We had insufficient cash and the supplies which I had left behind in Beirut, along with important mission papers on our mission cash, had been hidden among Arabic books on the shelves in the basement of the school for the blind. Well, this had been done because of the wave of looting that had spread through the war torn city. But even that supply of cash had apparently been lost. The building next to us had suffered a damage during our absence and had been looted and then set on fire. And the flames had risen high right against our walls. The heat cracked the blackened and blackened the windows of the offices. And there was danger, great danger of the fire spreading into our building and, of course, into the supply of books there. Well, 
I won't read too much more of it, except to say that uh, in further investigation, uh, Dad got a phone call from a travel agent and said, uh, we noticed you paid twice for those flights a few months back. We've got the refund for you. If you can come and collect it. Of course, Doug had no way, no safe way of collecting it. There were snipers everywhere and fighting as well. But eventually he did get the money and tucked it in a pocket. But of course, as they drove around, they were stopped at many roadblocks. And he said, it seemed that that money was burning a hole in his pocket. But the uh, people that were expecting passports and documents never did ask him to take off his coat. <laughs> and so the money was safely uh, returned to mission headquarters. And then one day in the semi-darkness, with, with torches, we were packing books and uh, uh, David Johnson, for whom we went to England in May last year for his uh, Thanksgiving service, he was uh, sifting through an empty box and there were just a few scraps of paper there and the light fell in the garden in its contents. He put his hand in and triumphantly lifted up a brown manila envelope. The mission money had been found. I'm getting bored notion of just reliving that at that time. So we got around up all of us missionaries and got, us, got safely to Cyprus. And uh, if you've lived in a war zone and then moved to Cyprus, it was bliss. Almost as if we were already in heaven. No shooting, no fighting, no roadblocks, nothing. And in fact, Doug Anderson related that quite often if he heard a bang or a fire streak, he could jump, shell chop. Yeah. So we must decide now, follow Jesus, mustn't we? Our circumstances should drive us to God in prayer. And uh, we have an obligation to pray about our work. Let's just make this a quick Point number two, I quoted John chapter 5, or I thought I quoted John chapter 5 last week, and I was surprised when I got home to find that it wasn't John chapter 5, and even more surprised that nobody in the congregation had picked me up on it. It's John chapter 6, and the verse is verse 27. Don't work for food that perishes, but for that which endures and the eternal life. In other words, Serve the Lord wholeheartedly, whatever He's called you to do, and He will be your provider. Yes, uh, our work is our calling, because I, I uh, counter that, the words of Jesus, with the words of Paul, who says a few years later on that he who does not work should not eat. So uh, Jesus' words are not a call to lay down tools and just uh, sit around and wait for him to come again. No, we are to work serving him. So if we're called to employment, then uh, we must serve our employer as if we're serving the Lord himself. Yes, work is not, and I'm reading my notes here, work is not for the purpose of praising our standard of living. It's a service to God. And uh, Romans 12.1 reminds us that uh, it is our reasonable worship. He, God, becomes our provider. We don't work to get money for the bank account. We work to serve the Lord via our employer, perhaps, or via our mission agency. But ultimately, it's God who provides for us. I'm going to read that uh, proverb, proverb chapter 30, and you can write it down in your notes if you're taking them, because it is a, a crucial one. Uh, but I think I gave you the gist of it anyway a moment or two ago. Proverbs 30, and it's verse 8. Two things, verse 7, two things I ask of you, Lord God. Do not refuse me before I die. 
verse 8, keep deception and lies far from me, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is my portion, that I not be fallen and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or that I not be in want and steal and profane the name of the Lord. Do not slander a slave to his master or he'll curse you and you will be found guilty, etc., etc. But uh, the point made there is that we need to seek the Lord for our well-being, our pain to pleasure spectrum, if you like. Uh, Lord, keep me from pain, uh, keep me from too much pleasure as well. Uh, let me enjoy life under your authority. And finally, I have been saying this all along last week, and I say it again this morning, if we claim to be Christian, we will prove it by being prayers, won't we? We will be prayerful people. That is the air we breathe, prayer. If we're gold diggers for the Lord, then prayer will be the spade that we use to dig that gold, if you like. We may not be, and I'm reading my notes here, we may not be praying Hyde or Martin Luther, but we must be prayers. Praying high? Oh, I should have uh, done my homework to refresh my memory. But praying high was somebody who was so uh, so noted for his prayer life that he got that title and nickname, praying high. Martin Luther would pray for hours for it before he even considered the day's work ahead of him. Well. We may not be so devoted to prayer. Oh, and I have, should mention Jesus Christ too. What an example as a prayer he was. Would go by himself to spend nights in prayer before the Lord. I haven't come to that yet. But if my home was burnt in the fire with all my memories gone, photographs and everything stolen, then uh, maybe I would spend the next 24 hours in prayer. Uh, hard circumstances are used by the Lord for that very purpose, to drive us to Him to be more prayerful. Australians haven't, by and large, come to that point yet. We have our prayer meetings, our midweek prayer meetings, etc., etc., our once-a-month prayer meetings, and they by almost by uh, definition go for one hour and then we go home and have a cup of tea and we enjoy the rest of the week. But uh, if we were living in Nigeria or Pakistan where uh, we would be constantly under threat of having our windows broken by throwing stones, etc., etc., we would be more prayerful people and we would be more dependent on Him for our daily prayer. We don't even have to pray that prayer as Christians in Australia yet. Give us today our daily bread. We take it for granted. We go home and the fridge and the pantry has got food in it to last us for several days. Uh, but uh, as Christians, whether we're in those dire circumstances or enjoying life, we need to be prayerful. For instance, if we are enjoying our present circumstances, and Nehemiah himself said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. If we are enjoying life, then our prayers will be prayers of thanks to him, will they not? And we will be worshipful of him. We will be considering the glory, the weightiness of God. And if our uh, circumstances are extreme or hard or difficult for whatever reason, a bereavement or a loss or things not going our way or even physical pain, then we are called to cast our cares on Him in prayer. Well, it's considered, I think, by Jesus in one passage, which I don't have before me now, it is considered to be work. Prayer is work, for which we do not get paid, friends. 
We do not get paid for the work we do in prayer, but we get rewarded, do we not? We get rewarded because on the one hand, prayer prepare us for future pear-shaped circumstances and that our faith in Him has not been in vain. He will reward us greatly in this life and the next life. A verse that I wanted to, and I've got it in my notes right at the top, and then I wanted to repeat it as my concluding point at the end. Again, it's in Proverbs, and it's chapter 18, verse 10. Most of you will know it very well. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Even the uh, Indian man in Assam, though he was shot and killed by an arrow. By the way, that'd be a horrible thing to do. A bullet would be fairly quick. You would be squirming in the dirt for a few minutes, probably, before an arrow had finished your life. Uh, so, uh, he wasn't going to turn back, and we aren't either, are we? The name of the Lord is a strong power. The righteous run into it and are ultimately safe in the arms of Jesus. That's our goal in life, to be as close as possible to Jesus, our Savior. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Him. No turning back. No turning back. Would you decide to follow Jesus as well? If so, you can stand with me now and sing this song again.